This is Amber Case. She is a cyborg anthropologist. Um, she lives here in Portland and documents the Portland tech scene. And uh, recently she founded the Portland Cyborg Camp, which happened last fall. So everybody, this is Amber. Can everyone hear me? Wow, great. Um, I think somebody in the audience mentioned hashtags. Is it hash O S B R I D G E? Okay. O S B O nine. Oh, we'll just add just just permutate on that until you get an absurdly large number, and every tweet is filled with hashtags, and we'll be okay. So. I am a cyborg anthropologist, and I'll explain that in about two slides, but what I'm going to talk about is um, how open source software spreads cyborg culture and allows us to be more and more cyborgian every single day. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It was recently in an article about open source in The Economist. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win, which is, I think, a lot of what's going on right now because well, open source kind of got ignored, and then it got laughed at, and then it got fought, and now it's winning, and that's why we're all here together voluntarily at this awesome conference, trying to talk about things. So what's cyborg anthropology? Well, it's the study of the interaction between humans and computers, and how the capabilities of our bodies are extended externally and uploaded into hyper hypertext. So all of you are cyborgs right now if you have a device that you're communicating with because that device stores some of your brain and some of your information and you can use that device to do greater things. It's an external prosthetic that allows you to hear all the way to another country at the click of a button as long as you don't forget to charge the batteries and it allows you to query anything at any time using Google as long as you're connected to the internet. So it makes you kind of omnipotent and omniscient at the same time, especially if you know how to program. So humans and technology co-create each other through an actor network of technosocial interaction. If we say we don't like a certain piece of software, we don't use it. It goes out of circulation. That piece of software can die out. So it's kind of a, an organically evolving system instead of a very mechanical thing. No longer is all the software proprietary, so we can actually help it evolve and do great things with it. So, um, one of my friends was talking about the fact that we have the backspace button now. And it's a really important button because it allows us to say, this is not completely set in stone. We have the ability to use the backspace button and edit anything. And because of that, a whole new type of culture showed up. The fact that we can edit code, edit text documents, edit wikis, create whole new gallons and gallons of information. And it doesn't have to be the same thing. We don't have to say, okay, well, we're going to release a book, and this book will be re-released in two months with a new edition, and then there's another edition and another edition, and we're cutting down thousands of trees. We just go and edit something and update it again or do another code commit. So sometimes we fail. Um, but that's to be expected. We're new to this. It's okay. Um, so the point is to, you know, carefully plan, talk about it before you do it, have a whole social community who understands it, and uh, not use technology as a solution all the time, but think about which piece of technology you want to use so that you don't overbloat everything with technology. So changes. So interfaces are really important. The reason that everybody's using Twitter and MySpace is because, it, well, Twitter's kind of like IRC with CSS, so people kind of use it a little bit more in, in the general public. So that makes a lot of opportunities for everybody to program certain things over it and use the API. But changes in interface have to be fast, convenient, comfortable, and without undue effort in a controlled environment. So don't make interfaces that look like this. And there's actually, there's a, the PDF manual on in the middle somewhere, if you can look at the little tiny yellow dot. <laughs> so the better the interface, the faster it takes to get information from one place to another. The faster that happens, the greater connectivity we have. And the connectivity means that there's less time and space, and that time and space is compressed. So um, over time, we're beginning to look like this. And 
this is actually a mapping of a bunch of the networks on the internet. And it looks more like a galaxy or a universe with kind of attention economy and attention clusters. And the great thing about this is it's not completely controlled. It's chosen by us. If we don't like something, we click the back button or we delete it. So early cyborg attempts. Um, this one didn't work out so well. <laughs> So I propose using something else. But more seriously, other early, in, early cyborgian attempts, that's a tongue twister, um, is Steve Mann. Early on, about 1980, this guy started appearing around MIT, and even the MIT students thought he was really weird. <laughs> and the whole problem with this is that he knew that instead of having to wear 80 pounds of computer walking around all the time like he was doing right here, that computers would get smaller and lighter and before long everybody would have the equivalent of what he's wearing right now in a little mobile device. And uh, he, you know, he thought this would happen way in the future, but he said, why do we have to contort to computers? Why can't they contort to us? And so he walked around and after a year, um, he finally convinced somebody else to become a cyborg with him and wear all this computer equipment to class and. Uh, he tried to make one so you could swim and check your email at the same time. Um, and he would have to apologize to people and said, I'm sorry I missed your email, I was swimming, I can't wear my computer while I'm swimming. Um, and so after a while, um, I guess, you know, maybe three or four years, 20 people on campus were, you know, hanging out, uploading their lives to the internet, uploading videos, uploading text. It's kind of like a, a primordial YouTube going on. Um, but now this is him today. All of that is in his glasses. So computing has definitely taken some steps in the lighter direction. Um, but this brings up a good point. If you look at this and you think it looks really crazy and you look at all the devices that you have in your pockets right now, it's pretty much the same thing. So the rule of marketing is just that if you put a hot chick on it, it will sell. So now, what's, what's happening right now? So computing is very interesting. There's a whole DIY movement, there's DorkBot, there's Arduinos. Um, Kelly Dobson said, well, what happens instead of voice activation, actually making a sort of code language that makes me able to talk to a blender? So she goes up to a blender and she goes, and the blender goes, <laughs> and then she goes, and then the blender goes, <laughs> so, Really cool idea. This is coming out of MIT, of course, where the Stephen Mann came out of. Um, this is a huggable device. It, you hug it, and it stores your hug. And then you can put it on somebody else, and it will hug them in the same way that you hugged. So <laughs> in three years, you know, if your grandmother dies and she stored her hug in this device, you can replay the haptic, tactile sensation of this person's hug. It's like storing a, a f random figment instead of what happens to somebody when they die and their Facebook profile goes away and there's remnants of them hanging all over the internet and there's memorials, there's actually a hug out there somewhere. Um, Project Lilypad Arduino makes you able to make wearable or uh, electronic clothing, which is really exciting. There's all the whole Arduino, and a bunch of people are talking about Arduinos today, which is really exciting. Um, so FOSS hackers are little wizards. If you look back in time or forward in time, there's the idea of the scrying pool. You say, hey, I want to see what's going on in Tokyo, and suddenly the surface glitters and glimmers and says, here's go what's going on in Tokyo. Well, you just look down at your uh, you know, iPhone or like Android and suddenly YouTube and you're looking at China or wherever you want to look at. So it's kind of like the scrying pool that we all have in our pockets. We've all become wizards and witches um, because a liquid interface bec can become anything. This is not real, by the way, but it's kind of a... <laughs> but the thing is that any, most physical tools can now be within this container and that can be morphed into anything. So if anybody codes anything like that, suddenly a new device can show up without having to actually physically construct it. So will we get bendable, foldable Google Maps in the future? We don't know how long that will take, but 
people will need to program that, and they might be open source, more than likely. So the problem with maps is that we look back in time and we say, oh, these maps are really silly. They made America look all out of proportion. But we don't even really know what our internet looks like today yet either. So in 10 years, we'll look back on it and say, ha, 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 that's really funny looking, just like we do for the maps in the 1500s. So the, um, the open street map project was a really cool idea. There's actually an animation out there where it shows all the edits over a year. And you can actually see when people edit and um, make a change to the site and actually upload their own open source maps over time. It's really cool. You should check it out. So remix culture is really useful. Sites like LL Cats and Graph Jam are really great. Um, this one gives us very great information about types of commercially available toilet paper, which brings us to the next point, which is about ubiquitous computing. <laughs> so when it hits the bathroom, it's ubiquitous, because if you're sitting there typing on your Blackberry or your iPhone in the bathroom, well, I mean, computing is now available everywhere, so it's great. You know, like you have to sit at your desk. Um, so, in a way, if you can get news in the bathroom via newspaper, why not get it by RSS <laughs> in this way? So, uh, <laughs> there might be some new laws. You can talk to some of the lawyers here today about this if you're worried. Um, or we might... <laughs> sit in place for a really long time. So also there are some dangers. The effects of the information society on one's ability to concentrate. Um, for instance, <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> so um, I don't, I don't know what to say after this slide. <laughs> so, cyborg anthropology says, we have been changed by technology, and technology's in our culture, and now it's everywhere, and devices have colonized our pockets, and we have to feed them with electricity and energy, and we have to make sure that the code works, and we have to you know, write patches all the time, and so, the study of it is cyborg anthropology because if you go to like a third world country and say, oh, how fascinating that culture is, it's so different, it's so unique, it's so strange. And then you go to the first world and you think it's completely normal for us to carry around little things that make dinging noises all the time and, and code mechanical objects that suddenly appear on a screen without anything else before them, then it's really strange. So that's why I study cyborg anthropology, and that's why it's really great to see everybody here in a very connective type uh, atmosphere. And I can't wait to see what everybody does today. Thanks for coming to Open Source Bridge.